Okay, uh, we're going to continue on here with thermodynamics. Put this day to an end at some point, all right? All right. So uh, last time we got into uh, chapter 16, I think. And uh, we were talking about thermodynamics. And we got to use uh, some of the other letters of the alphabet, which is kind of nice. Uh, so... Uh, in addition to, obviously, stuff that we talked about previously, or maybe you've had previously, which is our delta H, which is our enthalpy, uh, which deals with sort of the heat of a reaction. Uh, remember, again, our delta H, that is negative, is a exothermic process, which means heat and energy is released. Our delta H is a positive endothermic process, uh, which means heat and energy is being absorbed. Uh, with that, we looked at the idea of uh, entropy, and entropy is uh, delta S, and it's the amount of disorder there is sort of in the universe. So uh, when we actually have uh, an increase in the amount of disorder, uh, we will have a positive sort of value for delta S, and that's when we have an increase in the disorder. Uh, when we have a decrease in disorder or more ordered sort of situation happening, uh, then we will see a delta S that is negative. The easiest way to kind of see that amount of disorder is looking at the states. Um, so uh, when we do go for something from, say, solid to liquid, uh, obviously it's creating more disorder as those molecules now have uh, more energy and they're able to move around a little bit more. And as we go from liquid to gas, Obviously, they have escaped each other and they're flying around, which is creating a lot more disorder. So things in their gas state have a lot more, obviously, disorder than things in their solid state, which is usually a little bit more ordered sort of situation. So as we go from solid to liquid to gas, we do see that increase in disorder and also an increase in entropy. And remember that when we actually do see that increase in disorder, the entropy actually does become more positive. So a lot of times we associate negative things with kind of increasing and things being released. Uh, but here with entropy, it actually becomes more positive as we increase that uh, disorder there. Um, <clears throat> we also see that uh, when we increase temperature for the same reason, uh, we have uh, things moving around a lot faster and that's gonna create a lot more disorder as well. We can make a prediction uh, when we look at an equation based on the idea of how many gas molecules were either sort of made or are used up in a reaction. So if you look at an equation and you do see that you have produced more gas molecules than what you started with, uh, when you do calculate the delta S for that system, uh, you would anticipate that it would be a positive number and vice versa. If you created less gas molecules than what you started with, then you kind of created it more ordered. There's kind of two entropy values that uh, we look at and with the idea of spontaneity, as we also talked about, which is, again, uh, the idea that what we are talking about is whether or not the reaction will take place under those particular conditions. Again, it doesn't have anything necessary to do with how fast or slow it's going to take place. Uh, but if the reaction is spontaneous, it just means under those conditions, it should take place, could be fast, could be slow, but it will take place. And if a reaction is non-spontaneous, then uh, under those conditions, it would not take place. There is the entropy of the system, which is a lot of times also the reaction. And to calculate that, typically speaking, uh, we do our delta S of our products, which we could look it up in a table, minus the delta S of our reactants. And we also talked about the surroundings. So the delta S of the surroundings is equal to minus delta H over T, uh, the delta H of the reaction here, uh, and our temperature in Kelvin is our delta S of the surroundings. A couple of things you do want to watch out for, obviously, is we talked about some unit issues. Uh, again, kilojoules for delta H is typically the units that we see. Uh, for entropy, it's usually joules. So again, a lot of times we will use these values together. So you do need to do some type of conversion to get them to the same unit. So you're not off by that factor of a thousand. Remember that individually here, we can't really necessarily use either of these things to predict whether or not a reaction will be spontaneous. We typically want to calculate the delta S of the universe. And the delta S of the universe is our system, basically our reaction. 
plus our surroundings. So if you do calculate delta S of the universe and you do hit a positive number for that, uh, then it would imply that that reaction is spontaneous. And obviously the opposite would be true there. If it was a negative number, then it would be non-spontaneous in that case. Um, we also talked about the idea for the surroundings. It's an opposite relationship. So that is, again, why the negative is there. Uh, as the re system or reaction releases the energy to the surroundings, the surroundings under normal temperatures should be picking up that energy, creating a lot more disorder in the surroundings. Tip, I think, for the surroundings. Um, so again, if we have an endothermic process, which means the system is going to be picking up the energy from the surroundings, that's going to create everybody in the surroundings, obviously, to lose some energy, kind of not move around as fast, create a little bit more uh, order. So I think I mentioned last time we will see sort of a a version or an equation that we get uh, that looks very similar to this one, except that it's missing the negative sign. So when you are calculating for the surroundings, you got to make sure you have that negative sign in there to get the right relationship that's happening there. Uh, we also then uh, at the end, I think, talked a little bit about Gibbs free energy, which is delta G. And that is energy available to do some type of work. And uh, if we calculate delta G and it is a negative value, then that reaction is spontaneous as it is written. Uh, if you calculate delta G and it is a positive value, then it's a non-spontaneous process. And if you calculate delta G and is equal to zero, then you're at equilibrium. We also see that if the uh, delta S of the universe there is also zero, then it's also an equilibrium process as well. And because it's an equilibrium process, things are going back and forth in terms of the forward and reverse reaction at the same rate, which means, again, there's kind of no net change happening anywhere in the universe. So that's, again, why it's sort of equal to zero. Any questions on any of those things there? All right. So let us uh, take a look at Gibbs here, where I think we ended up last time. As I mentioned before, there are a, a few different ways that you can calculate delta G, as we will see. Uh, this is one of the ways, uh, which is uh, the delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. This is definitely one of those equations where you do have to watch those units. Um, again, our H is probably in kilojoules, our S is in joules. So you got to do whatever conversion you want to do there. Um, either take both of them to joules or take both of them to kilojoules. And our temperature does need to be in Kelvin. And... As we will see, uh, multiple ways to calculate delta G, as I said last time, pretty much the best advice is just kind of use the formula that fits sort of the information that's given to you. So clearly, if you have an H and an S given to you, you can plug it into this equation. So as we talked about here a second ago, if you do calculate delta G and you do get that negative number, then that reaction would be spontaneous. And if it's positive, it will be non-spontaneous in the way it is written. Uh, but if you do reverse the reaction, then all the signs will basically change and it will then become a spontaneous reaction heading in the opposite direction. So another way that you could calculate uh, Gibbs free energy is just like anything else. So just like delta H, uh, just like delta S, delta G as well, you could take basically products minus reactants. So you can calculate the delta G of a reaction by taking the delta G of our products minus the delta G there of our reactants. And pretty much like all the other guys there, uh, we need to take the coefficients into account. So you do have to multiply the values that you would find in the table. Standard free energy of formation is... Uh, the values that you would find in the table. So if somebody says the standard free energy of formation, delta GF, that's sort of a table value that you could find. Just like all the other ones, you want to make sure that you look up not only the substance that you're looking for, but you do find it in the correct sort of state. Uh, delta G is very similar to uh, delta H when you look up on the table in the sense that they are usually in kilojoules as well. And uh, things like uh, oxygen, nitrogen, things in their standard states will have values of zero. So when we talk about standard sort of states and stuff like that, where we see this sort of not sort of symbol, 
Uh, as I wrote last time, these are usually the conditions that we are talking about when we look at it. And under normal kind of standard conditions, that's 25 degrees for your temperature. Again, if you're dealing with any type of pressures, they should be one atmosphere. And if you're dealing with any type of concentration, uh, they should be one molar. So these are what are sort of tabled sort of conditions, standard conditions. And if they are not in some of those values, uh, you get sort of non-standard conditions, which is where you'll see a lot of times the thermodynamics sort of the same equation without the little circle on it. And usually that implies this sort of non-standard conditions sort of happening. Uh, usually the little circle will imply um, sort of standard conditions like this guy here or here or so forth. So why don't you try one? Here's the delta G values, I think, on the bottom there. Uh, what is the free energy change for the following reaction? And is it spontaneous at 25? Uh, so in this situation, we probably wouldn't want to use the previous equation there since all we're really given is sort of the equation. Uh, you most likely will not be given these values in the problem. You have to go find them in a table, obviously, the delta G values there. Um, so in this case, we would want to use uh, the delta G is basically our delta G of our products minus the delta G there of our reactants. Uh, so we're going to just sort of add up all the parts there. So we have 12 the CO2, which looks like uh, minus 394.4 kilojoules. We're going to add that to our other product, which is our water. So six times our minus 237.2. That takes care of pretty much of all of our products. We're then going to subtract it from our reactants, which is two times our 124.5 plus 15 times zero here. And once again, not given to you below, but delta G, much like delta H, will have zeros for anything in their standard state that's uncombined. Remember, it's only delta S that will have values for things like oxygen, nitrogen, those things in their standard state. Uh, delta G, delta H, they basically are zero. Uh, so that will take care of that. That means here, the multiplication action times my 394.4. Plus six times minus 237.2. We're going to subtract it from two times uh, 124.5. Looks like we're going to hit a uh, minus 6405 kilojoules in this case. First off, any question on the calculation? Just like all the other two, you want to make sure you definitely get those coefficients involved. This reaction is going to be spontaneous, non spontaneous. It is going to be spontaneous because we have a negative delta G in this case. So our delta G is negative, which means that we would expect this one to be spontaneous. And really what that means is we would expect this reaction, obviously, to be heading towards the product side. Again, doesn't necessarily mean it happens fast or slow. It just means that it should happen. Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> Now, thermodynamics chapter, like I might have talked about last time, has a lot of questions where they may not want you to uh, or may not give you numbers or values, but may ask you things like, hey, this guy's positive, this guy's negative, and the temperature is sort of normal. Would you expect the reaction to be spontaneous or not? So you can use this equation that we saw earlier to help us sort of uh, figure out under certain conditions, would we expect the reaction to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Keeping in mind, again, that there's sort of a uh, thousand-fold difference, right, between our H and our S as one's kilojoules and one is in joules. So uh, in our first sort of situation here, uh, if we have a delta H that is endothermic, uh, which means that we have a positive value here, and over here we have a delta S that as increasing, which means it will also be a positive value. In this particular case, delta G will only be negative under high temperature conditions. And that's because, again, there's that difference in units here, kilojoules versus joules. So really, to overtake the front number there, we need a large temperature to make that number larger than the first number to give us a negative number. So under high conditions, if they are both positive, 
Uh, that is when you expect a spontaneous reaction to occur. Under obviously lower temperatures, you would have a non-spontaneous reaction because it's not going to be big enough to turn that delta G into a negative value. If we go to sort of the next situation there uh, to the right box, and in that situation, uh, we have a delta H that's actually negative. So this guy's going to be negative. And we still have a positive value here for our delta S. In this case, no matter what the temperature is going to be, you will always yield a negative number, right? Because you can't have a negative temperature with Kelvin-ish. So uh, at any temperature, if you have a negative delta H and a positive delta S, you can make a pretty good prediction that it should be spontaneous pretty much at any temperature that you do it at, as you should be able to yield yourself a negative overall uh, delta G value. If we look at uh, the box on the bottom left there, uh, in that situation, we have a positive delta H and now a negative delta S. So this is sort of similar with that negative delta S It's going to turn the back part of this formula into a positive number, which means no matter what temperature you hit it at, you're always going to end up with a positive value for delta G. Uh, which means at any temperature, this reaction should be non-spontaneous because of that. And last situation there is the right box there on the bottom. And in that box, we have a delta H that is uh, positive. And we have a, uh, I'm sorry, exothermic, so I get the right there. We have negative in that case. So we have a... Uh, negative delta H and a uh, negative uh, delta S. So in this case, that negative in the back, once again, is going to turn this into a positive number, which means at low temperatures, this reaction should be spontaneous because the back part can't beat the top front part of the calculation there. But if we do hit high temperatures, that's going to allow perhaps this back part to be a bigger number and a positive delta G. So it would be spontaneous at low temperatures. So there's a lot of questions that you'll come across in this sort of chapter where, again, they won't necessarily give you numbers, but they'll give you things like that, like, hey, this guy's positive, this guy's negative, you know, at a low temperature or high temperature, do you predict that it should be spontaneous or not? So you could kind of use the equation itself to help you answer that. Any questions on how to do that there? <clears throat> So let's take a look at one here. We got this reaction here, a little calcium carbonate decomposing into calcium oxide and a little carbon dioxide gas. If the delta H is uh, 177.8 kilojoules and the delta S for this reaction is 160.5 joules at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so this is a situation where I do have obviously a delta H and a delta S given to me. So I'm going to choose uh, this equation that has both of those in there, which seems like a good idea, maybe. Uh, so again, here we wouldn't probably want to do products minus reactants since we got both of those values given to us. So why reinvent the wheel here? Um, we do need to do a conversion. Uh, we got turned that into some Kelvin. So that's a 298 Kelvin. So putting in our values here for this reaction at 25 degrees, uh, that's going to give us uh, 177.8. I am, again, going to multiply it by 1,000 to convert it to joules so that both of my units are the same. Once again, you could convert uh, the other guy to kilojoules, whatever you want to do, but you do have to do some type of conversion at that point. Minus our 298 Kelvin and our 160.5 joules. That way, they are both now in the same units, which makes it much better, I think. 177.8 times 1,000 minus our 298 times 160.5 gets us uh, 129971 joules. At this point, I can divide it by 1,000 and kind of convert it back into kilojoules, which is typically what uh, delta G is in. And that's out about uh, 130 kilojoules here. 
First off, any question on that calculation? That would mean at 25 degrees, is this reaction spontaneous? It is non-spontaneous. And that is what we would sort of expect based on what we were talking about a second ago. We have a positive value for this guy. We have a positive value for this guy, which means the only way to turn that delta G into a negative is this temperature needs to actually be a large value or a higher value than obviously kind of normal temperature. So since it's obviously not spontaneous at this point, uh, we can also, if we wanted to, figure out you know, when it would become perhaps spontaneous. So we could actually use the same equation here to help us figure out, yeah, okay, it's not spontaneous at this temperature, but when will it turn spontaneous? And that is, we could set our delta G equal to zero, and that is because we know it will become spontaneous pretty much at a negative number, right? Which is past zero there. Uh, so if we set it equal to zero, we get delta H is minus T delta S. If I move that to the other side, T delta S gives me delta H. And I do a little dividing, it gives me my T is my delta H divided by my delta S in this case. Once again, we still have that issue of units. So you got to do a conversion. You can't obviously do it with kilojoules and joules. So just like I did on the bottom there, I'm going to multiply my kilojoules by a thousand to convert it into joules. That way my top guy and my bottom number here, again, are in the same units, which is helpful. So uh, if we do that, uh, we're going to get 177.8 divided by 160.5 uh, times 1,000. It's going to give me 1108 Kelvin in this case. That's Kelvin. And this temperature here of 11, 1108 Kelvin. If I want to know in Celsius, I can subtract 273. So if I subtract 273 from it, that looks like I get me a 835 degrees Celsius. Uh, see that on my chart here. That's pretty good, I guess. That's like, that all worked out really well. That number represents the minimum temperature that you would need to do this reaction to turn it into a spontaneous temperature temperature time spontaneous reaction uh so that clearly would classify as a large temperature value right a high temperature value which is what we would need so under normal sort of temperatures of 25 degrees or so uh, this reaction is not going to happen and you got to get it up to about 835 plus to kind of get this reaction to occur that's what we see in this graph by the way what we see in this graph is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide versus temperature and Celsius. And the only way that we could get carbon dioxide to occur and cause pressure is if this reaction took place, since that is the only gas present, right? So the only way to get pressure is we'd have to produce that gas. And that doesn't happen to about 835. You may say, well, it does happen a little before that, it looks like. And it does. But at 835, we hit standard pressure of one atmosphere basically this is where we happens at 835 so a little before that we start getting it uh, but we get up to that kind of standard pressure at about 835 uh, degrees celsius so this equation can be used for a couple of things as we saw here in this example we could use it to just figure out whether or not a reaction is spontaneous and if that reaction happens to not be spontaneous you could also kind of set it equal to zero and figure out what temperature you would expect that reaction to kind of turn spontaneous. Yeah. Any questions on any part of that there? Okay. All right, so give us one go for the following reaction. We've got delta H is minus 1204. Our delta S is minus 216. At 25 degrees, will the reactants or products be favored? Okay, so once again here, uh, we're given an H and an S, and we want to know, is this reaction going to be spontaneous? So that seems like a good delta G type situation here. And again, we're going to use this equation as it has, guys. Um, 25 degrees, once again, going to be a 298 when we convert it to Kelvin, which we also want to do. So putting in our values here, going to give us our minus 1204 
I am going to multiply it by a thousand to convert it there into our joules minus our temperature, which has been converted to Kelvin times our uh, S here that's in joules as well. So doing all that good stuff, uh, gonna give us minus 1204 times a thousand minus 298 times minus uh, 216.4, I think. Going to give us uh, minus 1139512.8 joules. Maybe clean it up a little bit there. Uh, we'll go minus 1140 kilojoules on that. Again, since delta G is typically given kilojoules, might as well convert it back at the end. That gives us a negative value, which should imply that this reaction should be spontaneous, which also should imply that the forward reaction here should be happening. And that would mean that we would expect products here, right, to be favored in this case as the guy should be heading uh, towards the product side. Any questions on that one? <clears throat> this, again, if we sort of analyze what we were given before, uh, we had a negative delta H. We also had a negative delta S, which turns this guy once again into a positive uh, side of the formula there, which means the only way that this reaction... Uh, can be spontaneous is at lower temperatures, which this is considered a lower temperature, right? It gives us a negative delta G like we did. Again, if we had a really high temperature at this point, the back part here could overtake the front number and you would end up perhaps with a positive value. So under these conditions, we would expect it to end up in a negative uh, situation there. Question on delta G-ish. <clears throat> All right. Then uh, let's continue our talk of Gibbs free energy and energy uh, changes or transitions. Uh, so when we look at a couple of things, uh, when we look at a phase change, in this case, we're looking at uh, in this problem here, liquid going to gas, right? So that's evaporation happens at the normal boiling point, right? Is where that occurs. And as we talked about, I think the other day, uh, when we do our phase transitions, it happens at the same temperature. Both phases are in equilibrium with each other. Uh, and it's not really to get above or below, say the boiling point temperature or the melting point temperature that you fully sort of transition from one phase to the next. So since it is an equilibrium, what we know about equilibrium is uh, our delta G there will equal zero because of that, it's at equilibrium. And if we wanted to calculate the entropy change for that process, we could rearrange this equation and solve for delta S is equal to delta H over T. And that is from taking our T delta S to the left-hand side. And in this case, dividing by the temperature back over the other way. Um, <clears throat> this is the sort of formula here or the formula that we end up with in the situation that looks just like the surroundings one. Yes. So this one is the one that does not have the negative in there. So if you, there is no negative. And again, when you're doing this type of calculation that is derived from this equation, uh, there's no negative that is put in there, although people want to put a negative in there all the time because they remember the other equation. So they want to kind of throw the negative in there where they shouldn't. So keep that in mind as we were talking about delta S's surroundings needs to negative because that gives you the proper relationship between the enth enthalpy and the delta S. Uh, but in this case, you do not have the negative that's there. So when we put our numbers in here, this is our delta H. By the way, this would then be our delta H of vaporization, right? And that is 40.79 kilojoules per mole, roughly 2260 joules per gram. I think we talked about the other day. And that is the energy, again, that is required to do nothing more than change the state of this guy. So that's the energy to take it from liquid at 100 degrees Celsius to gas at 100 degrees Celsius. Again, temperature not going to change. Yeah. Uh, evaporation or vaporization, whichever way you want. Yeah. Uh, it's a delta H for vaporization, which is this, this process here is sometimes called evaporation or vaporization. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Other questions? So uh, in this direction, uh, 
going from say liquid to gas, uh, this would be a positive value for the delta H of vaporization because it's endothermic, right? You need to put energy in there to get it go from liquid to uh, the gas stage. This 373 is 100 degrees Celsius, right? And that is the normal boiling point of water, right? If you subtract that, so that is where that number comes from is the normal boiling point of water. And that gives us a delta S of vaporization, which is what is sometimes referred to, delta S of vaporization of 109 joules. That delta S is a positive number, which means that we would expect order to increase or decrease in this case. Yeah, the order is decreasing, uh, the amount of disorder is increasing, which is what we expect to happen as we go from liquid to gas, right? That's what we were talking about earlier. Gas molecules flying around, a lot more disorder, so we would expect that. What happens if we were doing, say, the opposite of vaporization, which I think they call that like condensation, right? If we were to do this calculation, what would really be the only difference here? Yeah, the delta H in this case would be a negative number, right? Because we need to release that energy to allow the gas molecules to slow down and go into the liquid phase. And that would then turn us into a negative 109, right? Joules. And that would also make sense going in that opposite direction because they should all be slowing down into the liquid phase, which is going for more disorder to more order in this case. And that would be reflected in our delta S for our condensation, if you want to call that. You could also do the same sort of calculation for delta S of fusion, which again is that transition going from solid to liquid, right, and backwards. That's the delta H of fusion is the number that you use for the enthalpy. That's like 6.02 kilojoules per mole, roughly 335 joules per gram. Um, and you can also calculate, obviously, the delta S of fusion, which, again, would be done pretty much the same way, except that the melting point or freezing point temperature is what you would want to use for water, which would be zero degrees Celsius, right? By the way, if you are not using water in a calculation like this, you have different numbers, right? You have different numbers for heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, and boiling point, freezing point temperature. So if it happens not to be water, you wouldn't want to use 100 degrees for the temperature because it might not be its normal boiling point. So you would want to use the appropriate boiling point temperature. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so let's try one. The enthalpy of vaporization for mercury is 58.5. Uh, the normal boiling point is 630 Kelvin. What is the entropy of vaporization for mercury? Okay, so we got our delta H of vaporization here for mercury of 58.5 kilojoules per mole. Again, obviously different than water because we're not dealing with water. That's also why, again, we have a different boiling point temperature of 630 Kelvin in this case. So this is obviously a phase change that's happening as we're going from liquid to gas. And we're going to use our delta G is equal to our delta H minus T delta S. Once again, because this is a phase transition, it's at equilibrium in both phases, which means that that will equal zero. Doing our rearranging to solve for the entropy here, uh, which would give us our entropy of vaporization is equal to our delta H divided by T. Once again, no negative on this one. Uh, we're going to put it in here. And I'm going to take uh, 58.5. I'm going to times it by 1,000 since delta S is typically given in joules just to convert it at this point. If you didn't, then obviously you'll get 1,000-fold less here. We're going to take our temperature, which also happens to be in Kelvin, so we're good on that. And that's going to get us uh, 58.5 times 1,000 uh, divided by 630. It gives us about 92.9 there joules per kelvin and here we do get a positive value for our entropy which again is what we would expect to happen as we're going from our liquid to our gas once again if we were doing sort of the condensation process uh, the only thing that we really change here is our number there on top would be a negative number because again it should be exothermic 
resulting in a negative delta S. And again, that would make sense going in the opposite direction. Right. Any questions on phase changes and entropy change? <clears throat> So let's then talk about our friend equilibrium because I, I miss it. It's been a while. So give three energy and equilibrium, which is K. Let's talk about a couple things before we get to our equilibrium constant. Uh, we have this guy here, which is another delta G equation here. And here we have actually delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT natural log of Q. And uh, a reminder, a couple of things here. This delta G is sort of, you could think of it as non-standard conditions. Uh, this is our delta G under standard conditions. And that would be your delta G of your products minus your delta G of your reactants. It's obviously one way you could get there. Our R is our gas constant, but it is not the one we use for the uh, gas laws. It is the one that has the energy component. So that's our 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. Our T is our temperature, which is Kelvin. And our Q is still our reaction quotient. And our reaction quotient is, again, our products uh, divided by our reactants. And it's calculated, obviously, the same way as we calculate K, uh, we still have to take the coefficients as the exponents and all that when we do that. So this is an equation where uh, we would want to use in some type of situation where it is non-standard conditions. So something is non-standard happening, which means uh, it could be the temperatures, maybe not 25 degrees. If you're dealing with gases, maybe it's not the pressure, uh, it's not one atmosphere. If you're dealing with concentrations or of uh, solutions, the molarity is not one molar. So there's one of those three things are not those standard conditions that we talked about earlier. So you can see how that will affect sort of the delta G of that reaction based on that. When we get to an equilibrium condition, this top uh, equation basically becomes uh, this equation here on the bottom that the delta G naught is equal to minus RT natural log of K. That's because uh, our delta G will be zero and Q will now be the equilibrium constant at the equilibrium uh, point. So that gives us that equation there. These are still the same guys as above. So that's our 8.314 gas constant. That is our K, which is our products over reactants and so forth. So when you use both of these equations or one versus the other, Clearly, we have not seen any other equation that involves equilibrium constant. So you have something to do with uh, Gibbs free energy and equilibrium constant. Mention something like find the equilibrium constant. You're given an equilibrium constant or something like that. Then clearly the bottom guy is where you want to go. Uh, top guy, again, as I mentioned, is a situation where you probably would be given maybe some pressure, some concentration, something like that. That's obviously not standard conditions. Uh, then you would have to uh, sort of calculate those too. Any question on either of those there? <clears throat> that looks like too many lines for right now. So we're going to go to this one, which is our delta G is equal to minus RT uh, natural log of K. Just like the other uh, sort of formula that we saw, we could also use this formula to make some predictions about what we expect to happen. And uh, the prediction here is really, if you still understand, hopefully, what K means and what happens with K, you can make your pretty good prediction. Uh, if you have a large value of K, uh, what that will essentially do is give you kind of a positive number here. And that, along with the negative number here, will keep our delta G being negative. And you would expect a spontaneous reaction to occur. So that all makes sense. If you think about it, if you have a spontaneous reaction, it's going to go from reactants to products. You should then end up with more products. Then you started with reactants, which when you take products over reactants should give you your larger value of K. So all those things tie together correctly. If you have a smaller value of uh, K or less than one in terms of its value, you will end up with a negative value here. And that negative and this negative will turn the delta G into a positive in that situation. And you will end up with a positive value of delta G, which means reaction is non-spontaneous. And if the reaction is non-spontaneous, it's pretty much not going to go to the product side. It's going to sit there on the reactant side. 
which means you should have more reactants than products in this case. And in this case, that will give you a smaller value of K. And uh, so those two things, again, sort of tie together nicely. So the good news is it's still the same sort of uh, trend with K. Uh, and you could just remember that if you have a large value of K, you should probably have a negative delta G. And if you have a small value there of K, uh, you should probably have more of a positive value for delta G. Any questions on those relationships there? <clears throat> Oh, let's try a few here. Calculate the equilibrium constant uh, for the following reaction. Delta G value for ozone is on the bottom and for O. Okay, so let's take a look. So clearly we are looking for the equilibrium constant. So that narrows down the field of equations to use. So delta G naught equals minus RT natural log of K. Again, really the only one that has the equilibrium constant in it. So it seems like a good choice. Uh, R is a constant. We do have the temperature given to us, which obviously does need to be converted there into Kelvin. Uh, we are looking for K. So we do not have our delta G not given to us, but we can go find that in a table by taking our products minus our reactants here. So that's what we'll do. We will take our delta G of our reaction. It's going to be our products in this case, which is three times zero minus our reactants, which is two times 163.4. And that will get us our delta G in this case of... Uh, minus uh, 326.8 kilojoules. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> At this point, we now have uh, all three of those things. So we're going to uh, put it in there and that's going to get us uh, minus 326.8 kilojoules is equal to minus 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole and our temperature of 298, and our natural log of K. Again, we do have some issues here in terms of units, right? We can't just divide it out, otherwise we're going to be off by a factor of 1,000. So I'm going to uh, maybe toss this over here as 326.8 times 1,000 to convert it to joules. So... Uh, <clears throat> that will get us... Uh, 326.8 times 1,000. I'm then going to divide it by 8.314. going to also divide it by 298. And uh, that's going to give me, by the way, I have a negative here and a negative here that's going to come along for the ride, right? So that's going to turn it into hopefully a positive number of 131.9 as equal our natural log of K. I basically took everything over here and divided it to the other side. Yeah. <clears throat> Any questions on that so far? Get rid of the uh, natural log. We got to take the E of both sides, I think. That's good. And put that in my calculator somewhere. There it is. That's going to give me a K of 1.9 times 10 to the uh, 57, looks like a winner there. That is a uh, big value of K, yes. It goes with a negative value for Delta G, which makes sense. It should be going to the product side, very much so in this case. Any questions on any of that there? So again, you gotta watch a couple of things with this formula, obviously, uh, you gotta watch units especially when R is involved as well, since that's in joules, and you got to watch the negatives as you move from one side to the next. Yeah. Any questions on that one there? All right, let's try uh, the next one. Calculate the delta G naught for guy at 25 degrees. KSP is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so once again here, we're really given a KSP, which is really just an equilibrium constant. It doesn't really matter, right, what the little symbol on the bottom is. Uh, so again, we would want to use our 
delta G guy that has a K in it. Uh, in this case, we do have K, we have the temperature, and we do have R, so we really just have to plug it in here, uh, minus our 8.314. Our temperature, again, converting it to Kelvin, adding 273 to the 25, gives us 298. Natural log of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6 in this case. Uh, that's going to give us a uh, natural log of 1.7 to the minus 6, gives us a negative 13.2-ish times 298 times 8.314. We also want to remember to also hit it with a negative at the end there. And that's going to give us a 32.914. The units here are going to be joules from the gas constant at this point, which we can divide by 1,000 to get it into kilojoules, which is typically what our delta G is in. And that'll be like a 32.9 kilojoules in this case. This would mean that this reaction is non-spontaneous, right? And we have a positive value for our delta G, which means not much going to the product side. Everybody's going to hang out on the reactant side, which also means that we, again, should have a small value for K, which is what we have with our KSP there of minus 6 in this case. Any questions on any of that calculation there? <clears throat> Now the moment everybody's been waiting for, the final example of the day. And then we're done. Or where you can leave. You want to leave it? What do you mean? I'm going to stand up and walk out the door at this point after we do this example. I hope. <laughs> going to head towards the parking lot, maybe, get in the car, you know, drive home. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to go. I'm going to go sit in a random class down the hallway for the rest of the time. It's going to. I don't remember you. I, I've been here since the first day. You don't remember? All right, let's finish this up here. I got things highlighted pretty done for me already. That's good. All right, in this case, uh, we have the delta G naught for this reaction is 2.6 at 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, we have pressures of 4.26 atmospheres, uh, 0 0.024 and 0 0.23 atmospheres for each of those gases. Uh, what is the delta G for this reaction? not given to us we're looking for a delta g so we really only seen one equation that has both of those in there our delta g is equal to our delta g not by the way it is plus here not minus which is what a lot of people want to do a little rt natural log of q um <clears throat> so we do need to figure out q and by the way we also will be using this equation because we are given pressures here and these pressures are not one atmosphere, right? So that is the sort of non-standard conditions that we see here. So these pressures are not all one atmosphere, which means we're not doing it under standard conditions. That's also why we're kind of looking for this guy here. So under standard conditions of one atmosphere and all that, they gave us our delta G, which is this value here. Um, so we're going to see sort of the effect of uh, these pressures that we see here. Calculate Q, it is products over reactants, so that would be the partial pressure squared of our HI divided by the partial pressure of our H2 times partial pressure of our I2, since we're dealing with pressures here. That's going to give us uh, 0.23 squared divided by uh, 4.26 and 0 0.024 in this case. That will get us... Uh, looks like uh, 0 0.5174. At that point, we have pretty much everything we need. Uh, so our delta G will equal our delta G naught, which was given to us 2.6. I am again here unit wise going to multiply it by 1000 to get it into joules. That's because of the R value I got on the back end there. So again, so everything is going to work out correctly. Alternatively, you could convert the R to kilojoules, but you got to do some type of conversion uh, so you're not off again. That's going to be plus our R, which is 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. Our temperature here, 298. And our natural log of 0 0.5174, looks like. All right, so we're going to take a natural log of that number. We're going to multiply it by 298. We're going to multiply it by 8.314. Uh, that's going to give us on the back end here minus 1632.5. And these would be basically joules. And then we're going to add that 
to 2.6 times 1,000. Uh, going to yield us a 967.5 joules in this case. Or if you want to kilojoules, 0.968, we'll round it there, kilojoules. First off, any, bless you. Any questions on the calculation there? This tells us under these non-standard conditions, this reaction is still non-spontaneous, yes, uh, as we have a positive value that's happening here. And because of that, we would predict the reaction to head in which direction? Towards the reactant side, right? As it's going to be non-spontaneous, it's going to basically hang out over there on the reactant side in this situation. So with the non-standard pressures here, it didn't really help too much there with the spontaneity of this reaction. Uh, it is still going to be non-spontaneous. Any questions? Yeah. I got it from, uh, that should be hopefully, unless I punched it wrong, but it should be uh, the number you get when you do that part of just highlight right there. So if you take all those guys together and multiply them, that's what you should end up with. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, we're going to lay it up there.